for, for quite some time when I hear that song, you know, growing up Catholic, I kind of assumed his, his reference to Mother Mary was some sort of Catholic religious uh, reference to the Virgin Mother and, and uh, come, come to find out his, his mother's name was Mary. And so, uh, and, and it became a, a even meaningful, because, I mean, a lot of us are blessed to have uh, uh, the voice of our mothers in our heads uh, speaking to us when we need to hear it most. And uh, so one of the reasons I like the song, besides its general nature, is uh, the whole notion of in the midst of crisis, sometimes uh, mom's the one that can calm us and help us through it. So. Uh, whatever voice speaks to you in the midst of your crisis, we hope it's speaking to you now and calms you and helps you open your hearts and minds to experience a powerful time of worship. Uh, well, we want to put another voice in your head that tells you that you're very important to us and, and you make a, a big difference in our lives. And that uh, Our church and our own family life would not be the same without you being uh, somehow a part of it. We're grateful that you're here and hope that hope that we can be a blessing uh, to you as well. Whatever a joy or wonder or transition or challenge you might be facing, um, we, uh, we want to be a calming, uh, affirming voice in the midst of, of all of that. Grateful to have uh, Linda back with us in worship and continue to offer prayers for, for her uh, ongoing recovery. Um, we know that uh, number of us are, are dealing with uh, uh, those uh, sometimes nagging, sometimes uh, awful uh, life experiences, uh, pains that we, we've got tired of talking about, so we don't mention them anymore, but they're still there. And we offer our prayers for uh, comfort and encouragement for all of us and our loved ones. I have been having both a problem with a big toe and my lower back. So if I fall on my face, just help me up. You know, I don't have to call it. I'm calling you yet. We're especially also grateful that uh, Carmen has has agreed to step in and help us out at the uh, at the computer uh, to to run the media. It's a it's a serious uh, commitment, and she's uh, already exhibited great uh, patience and talent, and devotion and skill. And, Beginning next week, uh, she's the one to blame if anything goes wrong. So, uh, but uh, no, actually, almost every time there's a problem, it's, it's me. So uh, you remember that. But we do appreciate coming and stepping in. Our uh, call to worship uh, comes to us from uh, Psalm 8. Ancient words of celebrating uh, an amazingly gracious God. And... Uh, I'll be reading the words in yellow and invite you to read aloud together those words in white. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the Avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than God. And crown them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All sheep and oxen. And also the beasts of the field. The birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our God. How majestic is your name in all the earth.
invite you into a time of prayer. I encourage you to open your hearts and minds to share with God in these moments uh, your celebration of all the grace that has been poured into your life. All those moments when grace has moved through you and helped you bless the lives of others. Uh, to share with God the areas where you're still in need, uh, where you're still lacking, still growing, still learning. Uh, to take advantage of this moment in time uh, to experience the powerful presence of the God who saves us. If you would close your eyes and bow your heads, let us pray together. It's not as if we have to come here to find you, O oh God. You walked in the door with us. You spent the night with us. You saw us through a Saturday, a week before it, a lifetime leading up to now. You've been present in the people who have loved us and the wisdom that has come our way and even the discipline heaped upon us. You have been present in the gentle, quiet morning and the fierce night storms. You've been present in, in every moment, whether we were looking, whether we noticed, whether we understood. And yet, we find in this moment a particular blessing because uh, we're here in this uh, place of worship. We're here amongst these people with whom we share so many memories and with whom uh, the Spirit of God becomes more powerfully alive here in, in, these play, in this place with these people. And these memories, uh, our hearts are flooded with, with gratitude. For you have indeed seen us through so very much in our lives. You have loved us when we were children and when we've been childish. You've loved us as we grew and learned and even recognized our own foolishness. You've been that constant source of encouragement and you've been willing to come back and care for us even when run away and hidden from you and pushed you aside. Even those times when we just out and out rebelled or very potently ignored you and all you have to offer. You are a God worth celebrating. Sometimes we do wonder human beings that we are why you bother with us. Partly because sometimes we get tired of bothering with each other. Partly because we're sometimes stunned at the audacity of the human race and the foolishness that still creates such pain. And yet, you have held us in your loving arms, lifted us up, in the midst of our crises, taught us lessons the easy way, the hard way, any way you could. You've loved us and loved us and loved us and your grace seems endless, even though sometimes we seem hopeless. And it's because of your faithfulness, because of that steadfast love, because of your witness through the church because of your ministry to each of us through the others in this room and those who preceded us. It's, it's how we have survived. It's how we have learned to see grace. It's how we have found a way at times to be gracious. And it's how we celebrate the fact that from time to time working together on your behalf we have been part of your effort to save the world. Let that effort continue as your spirit moves among us to bring us healing and hope. Let it be a powerful presence in our lives as we 
overcome our challenges and let it move out into the lines of those people we love who are struggling and let it move out into the lines of those people who are desperate and wandering and wasting away. Let that spirit be a source of life and redemption and renewal and let it move through us even as it moves us when together we pray those words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And
Scripture today comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans in the fifth chapter, ending in the beginning of the sixth chapter. I'll be reading the words in yellow and invite you to read aloud those in white. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Uh oh. <laughs> Crash. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I can remember uh, many years, and I suspect you've had them and you may still be uh, living them out of personal preference, but uh, owning and driving a vehicle that, as we would say, uh, nickeled and dimed me to death. You understand the phrase, right? And something seemed like it was always breaking. Something always need replaced, repaired. Little stuff, more than a nickel or a dime, but nothing huge. I, I always admired those people who had that insight and stamina uh, that even when it was large repairs, they, you know, well, the transmission went out, but it's okay, I, I know a guy. Uh, the engine blew out, but it's okay, I know a, a place. You know, and, and no matter what happened, they, they would get that vehicle repaired, they'd get it up and running, and they'd be heading down the road again. I always admired that. A, a different thing from those who who like to restore vehicles, that's, that's a whole different, you know, insane hobby of its own. But, but just like most hobbies are, are insane, come see my trains and ask me, how much insane money did you spend on these things, Josh? But it's, it's not restoring, it's just trying to keep this silly thing on the road, nickel and diming us. See, I'm the guy, I'm one of those guys, I spend barrels full of cash to avoid being nickel and dimed. <laughs> I, I, I was always driving and I still want to drive a late model vehicle. I like to drive a vehicle that's still under warranty and I've gotten to the point where when the warranty's about to run out, I'm about to head in to trade it in. Why? Because I can't stand the thought of being sitting alongside the road broken down, calling the wrecker, having it towed sitting around nothing to do, trying to figure out who I'm going to call to get a, a ride from, right? Just that inconvenience, that, that mess of a life, which, which is why it's particularly upsetting when I drive down the highway and see a, a late model vehicle broken down on the side of the road. Their new vehicle, under warranty, broken down, just annihilates my illusion that my car is going to be just fine. And, and I paid a lot of money to have that illusion of my car being just fine. I'm going to be okay. It's not going to break down. I can have confidence that it's reliable 
and that it's durable. <coughs> Durability matters. I, I rode a lot with a guy in, when we were in seminary. He wasn't making very much money himself, but, but he was driving a, a Subaru station wagon. Great car. It was always progressive, always um, safety, high safety. Uh, and particularly Subaru, known for being expensive, were also durable. They lasted a long time. You could put a lot of miles on these vehicles. It seemed to be worth it to him to have the durability. I knew a, a, an associate regional minister back in the day when and they were traveling the state all the time. I mean, he would go to Fort Wayne one day and Evansville the next. You know, he'd be up at South Bend one day and New Albany a couple of days later, just all over the place, tons and tons of miles. He drove a Volvo, which to me was a luxury car, but he says, yeah, but they last forever. The durability matters. Durability matters, and I think that Part of what Paul is trying to teach us in Romans and elsewhere is that grace is durable. It's in it for the long haul. It's going to be there regardless of what else in life breaks down or when you break down. Grace is durable. You can count on it. You don't need to be afraid or nervous or worried about it. Coming from, a, from an age, Paul and Jesus and that first century Judaism where the culture, the religious tradition, the religious leaders nickeled and dimed people to death. Hey, you were walking through the field the other day. We saw you picking grains of wheat off the heads of the wheat. Don't you know that's a violation of the Sabbath laws? You sinner, you? Hey, we noticed you were carrying your mat a little too far on the Sabbath the other day. You know, that mat that you sit on because you're a beggar, because you can barely survive in life. And, and we aren't all that worried about the fact that you can barely survive in life. We're worried about the fact that you were carrying your mat a bit too far. And it's a sin. You know, I, I can imagine these temple minions running around with scorecards, nickel and diming people to death. Hey, we heard that word you used. We saw that place you went. We know those people you're running with. Sinners. They had this wonderful tradition, you know, of using words like clean and unclean. Ancient tradition that they have used really, really well. You know, not only were you unclean um, because you may have had a, a communicable disease, but you were unclean because you were just the wrong kind of person doing the wrong kind of thing. And after all, what's the pleasure of being clean if you can't point at other people and call them unclean? This was the spirit. This was what was going on, they were nickel and diming people to death, beating them down, undermining them, making them miserable, as if life doesn't do a pretty decent job of that all by itself. <laughs> nickel and diming, and Paul is saying, hey, Jesus has come in with durable grace. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God's grace covers it. God's love is more than sufficient for whatever it is that those people are hounding you about. God's grace is sufficient for no matter what it is that's hounding your own conscience, telling you how unworthy, how insignificant, how useless and worthless you are, how unclean you might be. God's grace is sufficient to blow that stuff away and surround you with a steadfast love that will lift you up through anything. A durable grace. And it's going to survive regardless of your scorecard. 
regardless of your failures, your flaws, your foolishness. It's going to survive. There's nothing you can do, Paul will say elsewhere. Nothing you can do. There is nothing in all creation that can separate you from the love of God in Christ. Nothing. Whatever happens to you can't separate you. Whatever you choose to do can't separate you. It's a radical grace. It's a powerful, durable grace. And because it is so massive, it started worrying people right away. Paul addresses it right then and there in his letter to Romans. Okay, this grace covers all sins. This grace covers all time. This grace covers all of you, each of you. So that wherever sin abides, there is even more grace. But, he says, don't kid yourself. Thinking that, hey, that means the more I sin, the more grace there is. That means, as it turns out, I can get away with anything. Because God forgives me for everything. God's already forgiven me for what I'm planning to do tomorrow, right? God's grace is abundant and amazing and durable and there's nothing. In fact, you know, let's test the grace of God by some really ridiculous outrageous behavior. Paul says, no, let's not do that. Let's not put it to the test. Let's not be ridiculous about this. God's grace is abundant. It's durable. It's there. It covers all of you it's more powerful than you can quite yet fathom. But, let's not be foolish about this. It'd be 14 centuries later. The church, dominated in Europe by what the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, had unfortunately developed once again into a, a religious tradition that was nickel and diming people to death. Here's a list of all your sins and how unworthy you are, and here's what you have to do to more or less buy your way out of it. In the midst of, of that outrageous twist on the grace of God, Martin Luther emerges tired of it. Tired of it. In a day when, if you were Christian, you were Catholic. Martin Luther became the voice that led to the splintering, perhaps, and maybe the redemption of the Christian faith. Martin Luther hated the nickel and diming. Hated the hypocrisy. Hated the hatred and found Paul's letter to Romans and loved the grace of God. He loved the grace of God. So much so that perhaps one of his most famous quotes is this one. Do we have it? Luther in the 1521 says, Be a sinner and sin boldly but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. Sin boldly. Go ahead. Let's see if there's anything you can do to alienate God. You can't. You'll alienate everybody else. <laughs> but you won't alienate God. Sin boldly, he says. Probably he's being hyperbolic. Probably he's trying to make a point. Christian writers for the last five centuries have been working really hard to try to backpedal on what Luther said. Oh, he didn't really mean it the way you think he meant it. Well, I, I think he did. Sin boldly. See where it gets you. It won't alienate God. You can't wear out the durable grace of God. 
So if you want to go downstairs in the kitchen and get a fork and you want to come up here and start pounding your hand over and over with that fork, and you think that's going to get you anything, well, go at it. God will still love you. I'll send Dan over to talk to you and I'll call for an ambulance, but God will still love you. If you want to make foolish mistakes, if you want to do something you know is destructive and self-destructive, if you want to sin boldly, go for it. God will not stop loving you. Grace will not wear out. There is no expiration to this warranty. But you will cause yourself incredibly unnecessary pain. It's not that God won't love you. It's not that you'll become unworthy because, as it turns out, you can't be. You can't be unworthy of a love that God has really decided to bestow upon you. But you can make a mess out of your life if you want to. Right? Sin boldly. See where it gets you. It will not alienate you from the love of God. God's love, God's grace is more durable than most of us and most of ours, right? As it turns out, people we love a great deal can sometimes step past the line. I can't believe you did that. I'm so embarrassed by your behavior. I'm so offended by your choices. I, I, I can't, I can't comprehend how you could have been so selfish. I run into people all the time. I bet you do too. I, I just disown those folks. I just, I don't even like that name to be mentioned in my house anymore. My grace wore out. It ran out. The warranty's gone. The greatest lesson we have yet to learn is to somehow how to harness this durable grace of God. Quit drawing lines, quitting, quit passing judgment, and quit giving up on people. For God help us if God ever gave up on us. Go and sin boldly if you want to. See where it gets you. It won't alienate you from the grace of God. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we continued to learn and grow and abound in that grace to such an extent that other people who have made a mess of their lives can come to us and experience that grace. Not the judgment, not the ended warranty, not the lack of patience and forgiveness, but they can experience this abundant, durable grace in us. Let us pray. We certainly need guidance of God. Sometimes we, we just need the wisdom as, as feels at moments that we're flying in the dark. And we're bound to make mistakes. But there are other times when we have a pretty good idea that what we're doing isn't healthy. It isn't loving. It isn't caring. It doesn't serve your interests or those of your children everywhere and yet we just do it anyway. We, we know there's still some growing up to do. And in the midst of us being us, we're grateful that you are you. That your love abides, that your mercy overflows, that your forgiveness offers us a new lease on life that your grace is durable we count upon that grace today as we come before you as loving children and we count on that grace as we move forward trusting in the lessons it will teach us and the ways it will enable us to be children of grace evidence that you don't give up you won't let go. Let nothing can separate us from your love. In Jesus' name.
Gracious God, we come into your presence bruised, blemished, and broken. None of this put here by you, but by our own foolish mistakes, our choices to disobey your words and your guidance. We are broken, God. Broken, but not forgotten. Because it is through your grace that we come to this table and we find the mercy that you bring to us. We may feel we don't deserve it. We may feel unworthy. But your arms are spread wide and they welcome us. Just as Jesus has welcomed us to your table time after time through the bread and the cup that he so graciously gave to us before we ever knew we needed it. And Jesus comes to us today saying, come unto me. Your sins I have carried. Your burdens I am releasing from you if you will just give them to me. We make choices every day, God, that we're ashamed of. We hurt you over and over, and yet it is your grace that touches our hearts, our minds, and the depths of our spirit. As we come to your table, let us realize that you have given it all. And we are forgiven. We are blessed children. And we are loved immensely. Thank you, Lord, for all you give, for all you love. And thank you, Lord, for all the children that you have put in our lives that show us that we are worthy. And may we bless others in the same way. In your holy name we pray. Amen. In the midst, in the midst of great tribulation, time of transition, and unknowing, Jesus called his disciples together to celebrate the Passover, to recall the faithfulness of the God who delivers. In the midst of the Passover meal, Jesus took the bread and he blessed and he broke. He gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in memory of me. It was later in the meal, Jesus took a cup. Again, he gave thanks and he gave it to them, saying, This is the cup of my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. It's a cup of a new and everlasting promise. As often as you drink it, remember me.
because they loved us and because we have loved them. We love Alan and Sally, and we've been great beneficiaries of their love for many years. We're counting on your spirit to keep that love alive as they move on into the rest of their time. Thankful for them. Trust 